a man whose love for country had two aims, to secure the land of Ireland for its people and to restore the parliament in Dublin. He succeeded in one, but not the other. Parnell had several passions in his life. The land and parliament were two. The third was love, his love for Catherine O'Shea. She had three children by him over their long affair, and it was only after nine years that her husband sued for adultery. That celebrity divorce caused his political downfall. In essence, love brought him down. But a century before Parnell, love was a cruel law. 200 years ago, to some rich men, women were beautiful objects, not people with the same rights as men. I traveled to the strange world of a rich landlord, Robert Rochford, to see the dark side of love in the long century. Robert Rochford was a man of of considerable standing at his time. I mean, he was a man who was a very large landowner, MP for the county, high sheriff for the county. He was political and legal um, power in the county. Very good friend of the king, connections to the royal family. So he would certainly have been um, a man of importance, maybe even of self-importance. And did his friends like him? Was he a popular man? Well, like a lot of people of Wales, I think he was popular because of his wealth. How popular he was as a person is quite difficult to know. Rochford loved women in the same way he loved fine houses. Women were property, not people. They had to be beautiful, perfect, and possessed by him. He set his sights on a young girl called Mary Molesworth. She was all of 16 years of age, daughter of the third Viscount of Molesworth from Marion Square, very well connected. Um, there was only one slight technical hitch, and that was Mary Moulton couldn't stand the sight of Robert Rochford. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter because her father was the one who was ultimately going to decide who she would marry. And he decided Robert Rochford was the best one. So they got married? Yes, they were married and had four children in four years in Goldstown House, um, five miles away from this beautiful spot at Belvedere. But that's where she came as a young married woman, had four children, one daughter and three sons in the space of four years. Robert Rochford found married life tedious. He went looking for excitement in London. Mary was to remain at home, waiting. Alone, she formed an innocent friendship with his brother Arthur, whose wife and family lived nearby. But Robert was told they were lovers. Robert um, did what Robert did. Um, he pretty much overreacted very quickly um, and took immediately the, the belief that Mary and Arthur were both guilty. He said he was going to shoot Arthur on sight. This wasn't, it wasn't an idle threat. So Arthur left the country along with his wife and eight children. He hid out in Wakefield in Yorkshire for the next 12 years. Um, and then he incarcerated Mary. Mary was imprisoned while Robert lived the high life in London. His brother, Arthur, fled. After 12 years, he returned home. But Robert had not forgotten nor forgiven. Robert's wife being his property meant that he was entitled to damages for her actually having the affair. So again, it was damaging property. And £20,000 was placed as the value on that. Arthur was the youngest brother who had not the wealth, nor the power, nor the land to match £20,000. So poor Arthur ended up being thrown into a debtor's prison, Marshall Stone, near Thomas Street in Dublin. And then Robert proceeded to evict Arthur's widow, um, Sarah, eight nieces and nephews and took over all of their estates. So that when Mary heard this, and naturally enough, she figured, well, this is what he's done to his own brother. Her freedom was not coming. Mary escaped and ran to her father in desperation. But he sent her back to Rochford. According to custom and law, she had no rights in love. This time, all privileges were gone access to her friends, her family and her children removed. The odd occasion when she was allowed to walk around the garden, a servant rang a bell in front of her, so even the gardeners couldn't speak to her. 
Robert locked Mary away for another 18 years in what had been their family house, Goldstown. And he spent a fortune building an expensive bachelor villa. He entertained his male friends lavishly while his wife was kept a prisoner. This is his dining room. Yes, this is Robert Rochford's dining room. This is where he entertained in lavish style. This is where he had 16 courses, 12 wines, eight livery footmen and four valets for as few as three people at the table. Even the staircase was designed not to accommodate the wide ball gowns that women wore. What I don't understand is that if Rochford believed that his wife had an affair, then why lock her up? Why not just simply end the marriage? My view would be that if he truly loved her, he wouldn't remove all existence of her because it would be too painful to be reminded constantly. Our, uh, Robert, on the other hand, kept her there constantly as a reminder, um, which in many ways shows his vindictiveness of character, but also um, just the cruelty that he was capable of. To lock somebody up for initially 12 years and eventually for the next 18 years, to almost 31 years in total, that's not what somebody who's a loving husband would be capable of doing. But Robert Rochford was capable of more. His jealous nature assumed gigantic proportions when another brother built a larger house than his. I think Robert Rochford's um, vindictiveness and just sheer nastiness of, of nature ran very deep. An example of that is this wall here we have behind us. This is actually the Jealous Wall, Ireland's largest folly, built by Robert Rochford to hide the view of his brother's house next door to them because his brother George had built a house which was larger than Belvedere and built in one of Belvedere's best views. But George had an insult to injure by turning the back of the house to his brother and hence Ireland's largest folly. But what about poor Mary Molesworth? Mary Molesworth really to synopsize her life was a woman who was married at 16 to a man she despised, had four children by the age of 20, locked up by the age of 21, um, wasn't released for another 31 years and died six years later. Right the way through, always proclaiming her innocence. Right until her deathbed, she proclaimed her innocence, as did Arthur, the one accused of having the affair with her. Um, certainly it would seem from most of what I have read anyway that the two of them were entirely innocent parties and always proclaimed their innocence. But victims of Robert's Absolutely. vindictiveness and malice. Absolutely, yes. Powerless against him. Robert Rochford was a man who lived in the dark world of jealous obsession. But not every landlord was vindictive. One in particular had, if not love, plenty of compassion for his fellow man. An Irish landlord from Connemara believed in civil rights for all and changed history, at least for animals. I met Peter Phillips, who's written a book about Richard Martin, known for his compassion as Humanity Dick. But the Martin family were never what was perceived as typical landlords in those days. They had a benevolent attitude to tenants. They would rather take their income from smuggling commission than tax their tenants. So they always had a, an attitude that if people can't afford to pay rent, and it was very poor land that people were living on in the estate, uh, they wouldn't charge rent. And when did this sort of love of freedom and sense of compassion towards his fellow man, when did this begin to move into the animal rights thing? I think he always had it. I think uh, Humanity Dick Martin was somebody who wanted fairness. Fairness for animals, fairness for people, 
uh, fairness in general. As a child, he had um, two aunties on his mother's side that were fanatical animal lovers, which was quite unusual, very unusual in those days. There was that influence. He grew up amongst animals on the estate just outside of Galway. Uh, but the, the real influences would have been the two masters at Harrow School, which were preaching about animal spirituality at the time, which was really off the wall. Dick Martin later married. This was to be short-lived. The Irish revolutionary leader, Wolf Tone, was introduced to his wife, and they became secret lovers. His first wife had an affair with Wolf Tone, um, and then ran off with um, a wealthy English plantation owner. You would imagine that if, you know, if, if your wife has an affair with Wolf Tone, it would kind of put you off the idea of Irish independence a bit. <laughs> uh, it put him off Wolf Tone a bit, I guess, but it's... <laughs> Unlucky in love, humanity Dick Martin took his compassion to Parliament to campaign for Catholic civil rights. But he also saw another form of injustice, gross cruelty to animals. So he developed a series of rules where he lived in Connemara that were to form the basis for worldwide change. The Martins had, had powers on their estates to run a private court, and he developed a form of animal rights law. If he caught uh, tenants beating animals, he'd haul them before him, him, him in court, and he'd row them out to a prison on uh, Grace O'Malley's old island in Ballina Hinch Lake. There was a movement of animal rights happening in, in England at that time. One of them was his, ex, his old master from Harrow, who was now an old man, and there was a, a group of clergymen, but they were lecturing on it and preaching on it. But not politically... They, they weren't pragmatic. Martin appeared like a bull in a china shop and saying, right, now we're going to do it. Now we're going to take this, we're going to make it law. Yes. And he bulldozed it through the House of Commons and then through the House of Lords. And what did he do when it became law? How did he make sure well, it was this, enforced? This is, this is what I love about this guy. It was the day after it became law, literally the day after it received royal assent, he walked in the Smithfield Market in the middle of London and started arresting people. Because he knew it was only getting it on the statute book was only one step on the ladder. You had to educate the public, you had to educate the judiciary. So he enforced his own law. Three weeks later, he's prosecuting them in court, but he even then paid the fines. He realised that it would backfire in public opinion if families were made destitute because the breadwinner had been thrown into jail for not being able to pay a fine. He was just trying to educate the country in his law. He was, he was way ahead of his time from a PR point of view. Did he do anything else in PR? He famously now? brought a donkey into a court as a witness. What was the case? It was a case of a, a man hitting a donkey in the street. So he, Martin arrested him, brought him to court, and then brought the donkey into court. Now, from a legal point of view, um, it was nonsensical. But from a publicity point of view, the press of the day latched onto it. There was even a famous song sang in theatres around the country about Dick Martin bringing a donkey into court. That's how you roll the message out. I think there's, there's three or four facets of Martin's life that would stand him out as an exceptional um, man of any time, certainly one of the most exceptional Irishmen in history. One legacy, and, and people, I think, survive in time due to their legacies, was he put animal rights law on the statute books. He pioneered animal rights law. And if there's one legacy, that's a pretty good legacy to have. Leaving Kerry, I thought of love in its many forms. Jealousy, compassion, sexual desire. So I called at Glynn Castle, where a knight of Glynn was known as Rither and Amman, the knight of women because of his appetite. Writer Harriet O'Carroll talked to me about love. I think deep in the human race we have this aspiration to what we consider to be a really perfect form of love. And I think it is always involved in a relationship. People may have different parameters of different things that they accept and society may change but I think within human beings, there is this dream of, of what they would consider to be a really fulfilling love, and it is one of the 
the requirements of a happy life, I think, and uh, some people are lucky to get it. In the early 18th century, particularly in aristocratic marriages, they were definitely alliances. The woman was, um, her spouse was chosen for her, and she was chosen sometimes because of her position or because of her wealth, and um, the whole thing was an orchestrated event, really, in which personal feelings were just not expected to enter the equation at all. You had to marry where, perhaps for money, perhaps for um, family convenience. So rich men had power, less rich men had less power, women had less power than anybody. When you think about the story of Robert Rochford, who imprisoned his, his wife, I mean, one presumes that marriage is going to in some way, anyway, have, have something to do with love, but his treatment of her is obviously not loving at all, and you wonder what, what he saw his motivation as. When you think of many of the personalities of the 19th century, many of them had great reputations as, as womanizers, do you think their attraction was purely sexual? No, no. Because I think Attraction is never purely sexual. I mean, it can be sexual as well, and there's sexual, but in order for it to be really strong, always other elements go into it. And um, it must have been partly the personalities of the characters themselves, partly what they did, partly the positions in which they found them. I mean, who do you think of? You think of um, Daniel O'Connell. I mean, he collected huge crowds. He was humorous. He was a personable. He was a, a man to look at. That was attractive. And then Parnell, he had, he had an aura too. He had an aura of slight distance, which of course made him more difficult to get to, which must have been more attractive. To, to get close to a powerful man or to, or to an elusive man like um, Michael Collins, who again had a great sense of purpose, it must be you know, felt as a sort of an achievement. And also there's that nice feeling of self-importance that I think must attach to somebody who gets close to or has power over a powerful man. Love has been expressed in countless ways. Poetry is perhaps the most romantic. And in the years leading to independence, love and poetry brought together many people who loved Ireland. W.B. Yeats saw Ireland as a beautiful woman, but he was physically attracted to Maud Gone and sent her poems. But she loved the Republic more than poetry. She was in love with the idea of freeing Ireland, of creating this country, and um, it seemed to be her, to her, more important than a personal romantic love. She did have a love affair with a Frenchman, Milvois and she had two children, but she broke it off because apparently um, he wasn't co sufficiently committed to republicanism in Ireland. Do you think that, that love, in a way, was a kind of a, a kindling flame to the idea of independence? The right of an individual to love is certainly, uh, you know, a sort of a starting point for the individual looking at their rights themselves and where they stand. You know, I don't know whether the people who went into 1916 saw for themselves a future which they imagined or whether they just felt it would be, it was for the country, for all the people of the country, a sort of, I don't know how concrete their dream was, but it, was, it seems to me to have been quite a sacrificial love. And then you have the, the love affair of, of Grace Gifford and Joseph Plunkett right in the middle of that whole 1916. Which is so extraordinarily sad, isn't it? I mean, I think Grace was as committed to the cause as he was. And, um, you know, he, he made the ultimate sacrifice. He went all the way for it. The 1916 Rising was a violent assertion of love of country. To Joseph Plunkett, loving your country meant dying for it. As a leader of 1916, he was sentenced to death. Grace Gifford decided to choose love 
and married Joseph Plunkett in prison. She knew he only had hours to live. A wedding ring would symbolize their bond of love. When Grace Gifford entered a jeweler's shop on Grafton Street on the evening of May the 3rd, 1916, the promise of eternal love must have seemed a cruel irony because the man she loved was facing execution within hours and she knew that she would be bride and widow before the next morning. Grace went from Grafton 